What if Mace Windu went to Naboo with Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan in The Phantom Menace? That's our story for today. Had a lot of fun with this one. Hope you guys enjoy listening. And let's get right into it. Our story begins on Coruscant, outside of the Jedi Temple, as Grandmaster Yoda is meditating with the Master of the Order, Mace Windu. The Force was in turmoil after recent events with Master Qui-Gon Jinn. Jinn recently proclaimed that he encountered a Sith Lord, and he even brought a child he thought to be the Chosen One to the Council. Windu and Yoda were both skeptical that the Sith could return without them knowing, and Anakin was too dangerous to be trained, but their confidence was wavering more and more by the minute, and as they sat here, something changed. A ripple of darkness was sent through the Force, a ripple that, were Windu and Yoda not meditating, they likely would not have felt, and they were both snapped out of meditation at once, realizing something truly is off. Perhaps Qui-Gon was right about the return of the Sith, and after some discussion, Windu said that as leader of the council, that he should go to Naboo. If the Sith have returned, he must be there. And Yoda agreed, so soon Windu would soon go. What the Jedi did not know was that the ripple through the force did not come from the Sith on Naboo. Instead, it came from a Coruscant suite, as Darth Sidious killed his master, Darth Plagueis, sending a ripple through the force that Windu and Yoda felt because they were in meditation. But the ripple helped to wake up the Jedi, and Mace took off for Naboo to aid Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan. On Naboo, some time later, Mace Windu was flying a Jedi starship down to the Naboo hangar, and as he was flying down, a group of Naboo fighters zoomed past him, taking off into space. One of them tumbled to the ground below, and Windu figured that the battle above Naboo was about to commence, and so he landed his fighter to find Qui-Gon, Obi-Wan, Queen Amidala, and a bunch of Naboo fighters taking on battle droids. Windu used his own starfighter, to take out the droidicas, then he jumped down to join the battle. Once the droids were cleared, Windu greeted everyone and said that the Force called him to be here. Qui-Gon was happy to hear this, as it seemed like a sign of trust from the Council, and the group moved towards the doors to continue moving on Newt Gunray. But as the double doors opened, a hooded figure suddenly stood in the doorway. It was the Sith Lord. Windu looked to Qui-Gon, and Qui-Gon told Amidala and the Naboo fighters that they will handle this also telling Obi-Wan to go with Padme. Obi-Wan hesitated, but with Windu here, he trusted his master on this, and so he went with Padme and the fighters. Inside the doorway, the Sith Lord Maul ignited two sides of his lightsaber, while Maze and Qui-Gon ignited their own sabers, preparing for battle. Maze moved in first, clashing sabers with the Sith Lord. Qui-Gon and Maze coordinated their attacks, blending their different styles into a seamless flurry. Maul, trained for years for this very moment, defended well against the two Jedi, his acrobatic technique catching them off guard at the beginning. And Windu's aggressive yet controlled strikes meshed well with Qui-Gon's more measured approach, creating a relentless barrage that pushed Maul back. The Sith Lord, though very strong in the dark, struggled to find openings to counter their onslaught. Maul moved backwards onto a set of bridges in the refinery, trying to separate the two Jedi. But as the fight continued, Windu only got stronger in battle. He was now submerged in Vapod, swallowed by it as he fought to end the return of the Sith. Vapod is a channel for darkness, and that darkness flowed both ways. He accepted the furious speed of the Sith Lord, he drew the Sith's rage and power into himself, and he reflected that same fury upon its source, the same way a lightsaber redirects a blaster bolt. He was not afraid of the darkness inside of him, he knew how to channel it for good. And the fighting soon became effortless for him, and he let his body handle it without the intervention of his mind. As he battled Maul, aided by Qui-Gon, he was feeling for Maul's shatter point, and as the fight continued, Mace found it. Maul's need to prove himself to someone, a master perhaps, was his weakness. And in a daring move, Windu would unleash a flurry of strikes, driving Maul back further to the ledge. Qui-Gon seized this opportunity, cutting into the floor, and as Maul fell to the ground, Windu used a giant force push to slam him into the platform, knocking him out cold. The Jedi would go and retrieve Maul, and they would bring him back to their shuttle. As they got to the shuttle, by the time they were there, with Maul, Anakin had taken out the droid command ship, and Queen Amidala had taken the planet back from the Trade Federation, with the help of Jar Jar and the Gungans, and Obi-Wan Kenobi. Naboo was freed, and the Jedi would head back to the temple, with one stop first. Obi-Wan would guide them to Mandalore, a planet he and Qui-Gon were quite familiar with, as Obi-Wan knew that Duchess Satine and the Mandalorians still had a Jedi vault designed to keep Force sensitives in captivity. They would go to Mandalore, and Obi-Wan would have a very heartwarming meeting with Satine, 
and within hours, they would leave with Maul now placed in the vault as he was slowly beginning to wake up. Obi-Wan hated saying goodbye again, and seeing Satine seemed to have reignited an old flame. But eventually, the Jedi would arrive back on Coruscant with Maul. He was placed in the middle of the Council Chambers, where everyone could see the Sith truly have returned. And as Maul was imprisoned, awake but silent, burning with anger and hatred, Windu expressed that he could feel something in the Sith Lord. He was afraid of failure, afraid of the consequences, likely from a master. And Windu said he can still feel that fear, looking at Maul, saying he thinks that his fear of his master outweighs his fear of the Jedi by a lot. And after some discussion, Master Yarael Poof spoke up, saying that it is possible, with him leading, that the Council could mind trick Maul into revealing where the Sith Master would be. This was a dangerous idea, but Poof was an expert in mind tricks, and after some contemplation, the Council agreed it was worth a try. And so the collective group, with Qui-Gon also in attendance, currently in Yaddle's seat after she just left the Council, reached into Maul's mind with the guidance of Yarael. In unison, the Jedi said, you will teach us where to find your master. And after three attempts, the Council shared a collective vision of Maul screaming in pain, being electrocuted for failure. And the vision zoomed out, and the Jedi could see that it took place in a building in the industrial sector. The Council broke off the mind trick. Maul was breathing heavily, and he fainted once more, his anger replaced by fear. And the Jedi had a location. And it was decided that Mace Windu, Plo Koon, Qui-Gon Jinn, and Yarael Poof would go to the lair, while Yoda and the others make sure that the Council is safe, in case the Sith Master makes a move to rescue Maul. And the group of Jedi got into a transport, as Qui-Gon wished his Master was around to aid them in this. But Dooku was nowhere to be found. They traveled across the capital city, and soon came upon the building from their collective vision. But something was off in the Force, as if light and dark energies were swirling from inside. The hangar door was closed, but Windu fired a blast at the door, and it broke open. And at once, the Jedi leapt from their transport to the hangar, and they saw something horrific. Jedi Master Dooku was holding his blue lightsaber above Jedi Master Yaddle, who was laying on the ground defeated. Upon seeing this, Qui-Gon unleashed a quick force push, and Dooku was sent stumbling back to the hooded man in the back of the lair. Windu, Jin, Plo, and Poof got down next to Yaddle, and they helped her up as they all turned to the Sith duo. Qui-Gon looked to his master and told him to stand down, but Dooku only reignited his saber and said it was too late. He did seem sad, disappointed to see Qui-Gon, and from next to him, the hooded Sith ignited his own crimson red saber. It was now clear there was no avoiding a great fight, reminiscent of the old Jedi vs. Sith days. Plo, Qui-Gon, Mace, and Poof stood with their lightsabers ignited, and the fight soon erupted with blinding speed as Qui-Gon and Mace engaged Sidious. Their fight together against Maul allowed them to grow as a duo. Plo Koon, with Yaddle back in the fight as well, focused on Master Dooku, matching him evenly. Yarael Poof leaped into the fray as well. However, Sidious was able to cut off Poof's hands, then snapped his neck with his and Poof's saber like a pair of scissors. Despite the unexpected loss, the Jedi pressed on. Windu's Vapod style crackled with ferocity, while Qui-Gon Jinn's measured strikes were a great help. Plo Koon was pushing Dooku back, and he was forced to regroup with his master. Sidious and Dooku were a lethal pair, and once back together, Sidious spun and cut through Yaddle, killing her once and for all. Mace took this opportunity to attempt a lethal stab, but Sidious dodged it and kicked Mace to the ground. Qui-Gon battled Dooku now, and after a few strikes, Dooku beat his former Padawan, slicing into Qui-Gon's leg, then through his arm, and Qui-Gon fell to the ground. Sidious watched as Dooku was now facing a true test. Could he kill his former Padawan? Dooku lifted his saber, hesitated, and Sidious scowled with anger. He couldn't do it. So Sidious shot a huge blast of lightning at Dooku and Qui-Gon, hoping to catch them off guard. But Plo Koon rejoined the fight, and he caught the Sith lightning, firing back his own yellow lightning, known as Electric Judgment, into the Sith lightning. This caught Sidious completely off guard, and the lightning caused an explosion that sent Plo and Sidious crashing against the walls. Windu and Dooku walked over to Sidious, and Dooku knew now that he would never be able to go back to the Sith after this betrayal. Instead, he would have to hope that this would be a wake-up call for the Jedi and the Republic. And Sidious decided a surrender would be his best option. He could find a way to trick the Senate into believing the Jedi were evil after arresting him. But as he put his hands out, a blue blade swiftly swung across his neck, 
killing the Sith Lord. Windu snapped at Dooku, but Dooku simply said that he was too dangerous to be left alive. Windu knew that nothing could be done, and if nothing else, at least the Sith were dead or captured. And from here, Dooku would return to the Jedi Temple with the Jedi, and be given time to speak in front of the entire council. Maul was taken below the temple to the prison area, where he would be dealt with later, and Dooku decided to lay out everything he knew. If the Jedi weren't ready to listen now, then they never would be. And Dooku described how he began to have his doubts in the Order and the corruption of it, and the rising Sith could feel this as well. So he was approached by the Sith, who was secretly Chancellor Palpatine, with promises of eradicating the corruption, which the Jedi choose to ignore. Dooku said he has done terrible things, many of which he has begun to regret, but he lost faith in the Jedi long ago, and he saw this to be the only path. Dooku would lay out the clone armies on Kamino, the death of sifo and everything else he was involved in. Luckily, the clone army was not in true production yet, so perhaps the Jedi could still shut it down. And once the Jedi knew everything, Dooku said he would be leaving the Order for good. If they want to try and arrest him for his crimes, so be it. But Windu shook his head, thanked Dooku for his service in defeating the Sith, and he sent Dooku away to leave the Order behind. The Jedi were in a tough spot. They had to face the reality of where they were. And a few hours later, as the Jedi were still reeling from everything, Qui-Gon Jinn found Yoda in the Room of a Thousand Fountains. Qui-Gon had just been with the young Anakin and Obi-Wan, as Obi-Wan was showing Anakin all around the temple. And now Qui-Gon told Yoda that he would train Anakin, or he would leave the Order to do it. And Qui-Gon said that the Sith were defeated for now, but the Jedi must understand that they will not stay down forever. The only way to stay ready is to acknowledge the existence of the Dark, and they will need the Chosen One. Qui-Gon also said that, if Yoda is willing, he will take Yaddle's seat on the High Council. If the Jedi were truly willing to change, then Qui-Gon wanted to be a part of it. Yoda smiled at Qui-Gon and said it would be most welcome. The old Grand Master said that he failed. He was too old, too rigid, too arrogant to believe the Sith could ever return without him knowing. But now, with them dead, he sees that the Order must grow in knowledge. And so Qui-Gon would soon take his new seat on the Council, and train the young Anakin Skywalker. Within a few days, Obi-Wan would decide to leave the Order. Seeing Satine again, he just couldn't let her go. And with the Sith gone and peace being put back into place, Obi-Wan left for his love, which did make Qui-Gon happy for him. From here, as the Jedi Council was trying to change, a huge change would come for the Republic. With Chancellor Palpatine missing, there was a clear void in the middle of everything, until Dooku of Sereno, former Jedi Master, hosted a meeting. Dooku said that he, as a Jedi, found out that Palpatine was a Sith Lord creating corruption for his own gain. Dooku would lay out evidence from the banking clan records, interactions with the Trade Federation, even tracing the death of sifo back to the Sith. And Dooku said that he, with the help of the Jedi, was able to take Palpatine down. And in the new election, Dooku announced that he would be running for Chancellor as an ex-Jedi that vows to bring a true end to corruption in the Republic. Dooku was running against Mas Amida and Bail Antilles, and when the election concluded within a few weeks, Dooku actually won in a rather large landslide. Mas Amida was too close to Palpatine, and Antilles was just seen as more of the same. The people wanted something different, and Dooku was a charismatic, influential being, so he would become Chancellor Dooku. In the coming weeks after this, Dooku would promote Senator Padme Amidala of Naboo to become his vice chair, replacing Masameda. He could see that Padme had a very bright future, and when he eventually dies, Dooku wants someone young, energetic, kind, and wants to help those in need and help him eradicate corruption. Padme would accept this role with excitement. And the next 20 years would be filled with peace for the Jedi Order and for the Republic. The Jedi Council would grow after the return of the Sith, and they would work on expanding back into the mid and outer rims. Qui-Gon was an excellent council member, who was not afraid to challenge others when needed, helping the council not grow stagnant. Members like Plo Koon and Aegon Kolar would be influenced by Qui-Gon to speak up when needed more often. And Anakin Skywalker would be trained by Qui-Gon, becoming a great Jedi, eventually also freeing Anakin's mother. At 20 years old, he was one of the best swordsmen in the galaxy, able to beat just about anyone in a sparring match, and his rebellious yet joyous personality rubbed off in a good way on the Jedi Order, as Qui-Gon encouraged Anakin to be himself, rather than an emotionless Jedi. Anakin would grow strong, and form a great attachment to Qui-Gon, who he saw as the father he never had. Overall, 
things were good in the galaxy, Chancellor Dugu and Vice Chancellor Padme had restored the Republic to be at its best since they took over. There was no influence from the Sith, Plagueis, or Sidious, and the Trade Federation and Banking Clan was investigated heavily as corrupt members Newt Gunray and San Hill were arrested. Perhaps the most surprising development was from Darth Maul. After being captured, Maul was kept in the Jedi Temple prison, but he was given great food and often was invited to meditation sessions with the Jedi after these few years. The Jedi would focus heavily on ridding Maul of his darkness, and after a decade, Maul would finally embrace the light and begin learning the Jedi way under the tutelage of Yoda, who embraced this in order to learn more about the darkness from Maul. Overall, things were good, but the darkness would never die for good. Sometime after the death of Sidious, a group of Sith cultists from the planet of Exegol would follow the Dark Pulse from Coruscant to find the body of Darth Plagueis. For most of his life, Plagueis focused on learning to influence his midichlorians to give him eternal life. And after Sidious killed Plagueis, the midichlorians in his body never truly died out. Sidious planned to cremate him, as this would kill him for good, but he died before he had this opportunity. And so the cultists were able to take Plagueis to Exegol, and for years they worked on experimenting with him, reviving his midichlorians. And one day, ten years after Plagueis' original death, he was brought back. Plagueis would learn of the state of the galaxy, and find out everything was ruined. Palpatine was dead, Maul was a Jedi, Dooku was the Chancellor, Qui-Gon Jinn was training the Chosen One, and the people of the galaxy were embracing the Jedi, literally the worst outcome for the Sith in every single way. And so Plagueis, who was alive but weak, would spend ten years working on his own power rather than galactic power. If he could become strong enough, then he would take the galaxy by force rather than through political manipulation. And for ten years, he focused on learning powers similar to the ancient Darth Nihilus, where he would feed on the living force energy of others in order to make himself stronger. Unfortunately for Plagueis, his greatest weakness was perhaps his quest to perfect mastery over the Force. Yes, he had conquered death, but he was a shell of himself, and in his quest to become like Nihilus, he went too far. Plagueis learned the power, but it consumed him, and if he did not feed quickly, he would die. So Plagueis was forced to consume the hundreds of Sith cultists, helping him on Exegol, draining them of their Force energy, leaving lifeless husks in their place. And this mass force drain was felt across the galaxy, all the way on Coruscant. And because the Jedi were now more open to the darkness, they felt this. Inside the Jedi Temple, the Council was in session, going over what this possibly could have been, when the doors swung open to reveal Chancellor Dooku. And Dooku had a worried look on his face. He was much older now, and the years of politics along with his age had turned his hair and beard grey. But Dooku said he felt this pulse, and during his time training in the dark side, he learned of an ancient Sith planet called Exegol, but it was supposed to only be a legend. Though if the Sith were truly still around, there was only one place they could be hidden for all these years without being found by the Jedi. Windu asked how to find this planet, and Dooku said only a Sith Wayfinder could lead them, and Dooku knew only of one of these Wayfinders. It was said to be on Mustafar. And so, for the first time since leaving the Order, Dooku would lead a Jedi mission, with Anakin Skywalker by his side. It would be just the two of them, as Dooku and the Jedi decided it should be the Chosen One and the Chancellor going on this mission, as the Wayfinder would only be given to those who harbored a dark side. Though Anakin was a Jedi, there was no denying he always carried a deep darkness. Dooku and Skywalker would go to Mustafar, and the two of them would actually get on well. Anakin had many stories about Qui-Gon that Dooku enjoyed, and Dooku saw a lot of himself in Anakin. On Mustafar, the two of them would encounter a giant spider leg creature that was protecting the Wayfinder. It would question them about their loyalties, saying only the strongest can be allowed to find Exegol, and after a while, the creature would grant Dooku and Skywalker access to the Wayfinder, seeing they were truly capable and powerful in the Force. And so the two of them would travel to Exegol. Upon arrival, lightning crackled through the air, the planet was extremely dark, and there was a feeling that was devoid of life. Whatever happened here recently wiped out nearly everything that lived. But as they reached the bottom, the two of them found a lone survivor. It was Darth Plagueis, and he was becoming more of a husk than a man. He was in desperate need of a new force drain to give him life, and now he had perhaps the two strongest beings in the galaxy. Darth Plagueis stood and faced his adversaries with a wicked smile. This was a moment twenty years in the making. Chancellor Dooku knew this was Plagueis. Somehow, 
Plagueis has returned. And Plagueis was a hollow shell of his former self, his once imposing figure now frail, hungered for the life force of his opponents to sustain his existence. Anakin and Dooku ignited their lightsabers as lightning ignited around them, and they saw the ground. It was littered with bodies of the cultists. With a guttural growl, Plagueis unleashed the dark powers that he'd gleaned from the ancient teachings of Nihilus. Tendrils of black and force energy swirled around him like a shroud of death. Dooku and Anakin, the fiery embodiment of the Chosen One, stood firm, their lightsabers at the ready. Plagueis ignited his own red saber, and as the clash of blades echoed across the landscape, Plagueis pressed forward with determination. His eyes were burning with hunger. Dooku fought with precision, his every movement showing he was still an elite duelist, while Anakin unleashed his own raw power. But despite their skills, Plagueis' assault began to take its toll. He was beginning to drain them. He was embracing the dark side energies of the planet, and Dooku's defenses faltered under this onslaught. Anakin as well felt this drain on his strength, his connection to the Force weakening with each moment, as Plagueis soon caught them in his Force drain. He sent the two Jedi to their knees, and he truly began to drain them of their life force. He felt like he was gaining strength, and soon he would return to Coruscant to take all of the Jedi. But Dooku looked to Anakin, and saw that perhaps his destiny is to save the Chosen One. So in a moment of selfless sacrifice, Dooku met Anakin's gaze, an understanding passing between them. And Dooku screamed out, grabbing Plagueis with the Force, and the Sith Lord had to focus all of his powers on Dooku, giving Anakin an opening. Anakin called his and Dooku's sabers to his hands, flipped over Dooku, and plunged both sabers through Plagueis' body. The Sith Lord let out a huge roar, and he died with a force explosion that sent Anakin and Dooku flying across the landscape. Plagueis exploded into nothing. He was officially gone. And Anakin would soon slowly wake up to hear nothing but complete silence. Even the lightning in the air seemed to have stopped. And as the winds of Exegol carried away the echoes of battle, Anakin knelt beside Dooku. And Dooku, in his dying breaths, told Anakin he has fulfilled the prophecy, just as Qui-Gon always thought. And with a smile, the Chancellor died after saving the galaxy. Anakin would take his body and return to Coruscant with the news. Dooku sacrificed himself in order to save the galaxy. There would be a great funeral for the fallen Chancellor. And after a few days, Anakin would be tasked with helping to guide in the new Chancellor, Chancellor Padme Amidala, into her new role. Anakin and Padme would get along astonishingly well. And once they were alone after her promotion ceremony, Padme and Anakin agreed that they should meet much more often, for Jedi and Republic business, of course. And eventually, Anakin would even accompany Padme to a mission to Mandalore to discuss peace talks, which would end with a sort of double date, with Padme and Anakin meeting with Obi-Wan Kenobi and Satine. And folks, that is our story for today. Wanted to end on that fun little Padme, Satine, Obi-Wan, Anakin note. I thought that was cool. But you may be wondering, how the heck? Does a story where Windu just goes to Naboo end up with Anakin and Dooku fighting Plagueis on Exegol? I don't know, but the more I wrote my script, my outline, I was like, you know what? I don't just want it to end after Dooku becomes Chancellor. I want to expand. I want, I want to have some fun. And in canon or legends, you know, whatever. Um, Palpatine actually does cremate Plagueis and he puts him in the statues in his office. So I thought, you know, what if he didn't? Treatmate Plagueis in this. His Metachlorians could still be barely alive, and I'd have the Sith cultist experiment on him. I thought that was fun, but overall, um, Windu going to Naboo, I think he can defeat Maul pretty quickly with the help of Qui Gon for sure. Like, in the end, Obi Wan was the one that defeated him, so if you put Windu in there, I think him and Qui Gon do it. They take Maul, they don't kill him, and they use the mind trick that we see in the Clone Wars with the Jedi use on Cad Bane, but they do the entire council. Yariel Poof, who is very good at mind tricks, leads it. They go to the Sith Lawyer. Uh, their Dooku turns on Palpatine in the end because he just can't kill Qui-Gon, which I like doing that storyline. Uh, Palpatine's like, fine, you guys can arrest me. Dooku cuts his head off because he's too dangerous to be left alive. Anyways, I like the idea of Chancellor Dooku as well. What do you guys think of this story? I really enjoyed it. A lot going on that just leads from Windu going to Naboo, but that's what it's all about. Appreciate you guys watching, and I'll see you in the next video.